ICBMs can bias a president towards launching nuclear weapons very quickly in a crisis. And this has been you know, openly acknowledged by um, former commanders of U.S. Strategic Command and former secretaries of defense who have suggested that the ICBM force um, is inherently vulnerable right, by the fact that they have these known fixed locations. That's the voice of Matt Corda, research associate for the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Good news, Tom. As we speak, the giant container ship ever given that blocked the Suez Canal for six very long days is finally moving again, clearing the way for traffic to resume. Hi, Michelle. And yes, what a story. I think we can all relate to that poor person who was the captain of that ship. Uh, Talk about a bad day. My refrigerator broke over the weekend, but at least I did not block international shipping. Uh, So let's get in today's show. Who do you have lined up for early warning, Michelle? Well, in an apt comparison to the stuck ship, today we're focusing on the growing concerns about the lack of movement on the United States and Iran returning into compliance with the nuclear deal. Donna Farver, the organizing director at NIAC Action, tells us what individuals can do to let policymakers know what they want to see and help get diplomacy moving again. And after that, I sit down with Matt Corda. He's a research associate at the Federation of American Scientists. We discuss the proposed intercontinental ballistic missile known as the ground-based strategic deterrent. FAS just released a new report by Matt that examines the Pentagon's flawed thinking behind this $264 billion program, so please stay tuned. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a reading. Every little bit helps us to grow our show and our audience. And if you want your question answered in our Q&A section, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. But with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now... Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today I'm joined by Donna Farber, National Organizing Director at NIAC Action. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. As you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear and national security news starting now. It's more than 60 days into the Biden-Harris administration, and we are seeing more and more calls for the administration to step up its efforts to rejoin the nuclear deal with Iran. As Representative Barbara Lee said recently, we have a short window of opportunity. How are you feeling about the situation? Honestly, feeling a bit anxious. Um, I think as an organizer, it's hard to defer to our elected officials. We always feel like we have to be taking action in order to be getting them to do the right thing. And I can't help but think of friends and family in Iran who are suffering under economic and humanitarian sanctions right now. The, The middle class in Iran is struggling. So as an Iranian American, there's a this extra piece of pressure that we have um, on top of, you know, not wanting another war in the Middle East, that we have this anxiety around how our family members and our friends back in Iran are, are handling this long wait period, essentially, before hopefully we knock on wood, return and restore the JCPOA. Why do you think things have been so slow? That's a good question. I would say there are holdups on both the U.S. and the Iranian side. So on the U.S. side, you know, we saw Biden during his campaign say that if Iran goes back to compliance, that the U.S. goes back to compliance. And he called maximum pressure a failure and called for COVID relief last spring uh, while Trump was still in office. 
So to, to many of us as activists and advocates on this issue, uh, we had high hopes for a swift return. Uh, but publicly, the U.S. has been pushing this more untenable talking point of if Iran goes back, then we go back. Um, but in the meantime, what the United States has done is primarily symbolic overtures. And at the end of the day, we think that the United States actually needs to take more tangible overtures to, to show the Iranians that they can trust the United States again. At the end of the day, Trump breaking uh, the nuclear agreement and later withdrawing the United States um, was a, a break in trust. Uh, so the United States needs to reestablish that. But in the meantime, all they've really done is, is very symbolic things. So lifting the very stringent travel restrictions on Iranian diplomats um, and rescinding Trump's claim last year that the UN sanctions have been snapped back, even though no one else accepted that claim. So again, this was a very symbolic act. And all the while, the Biden team has refused to ease any of the maximum pressure sanctions or provide any humanitarian relief like Biden promised on the campaign trail. So there hasn't been any tangible goodwill gestures. Since then, uh, we've actually seen the Biden team shift and their public talking points, you know, they're, they're saying now that they'd be more open to a mutual return. And at the end of the day, what they want is for Iran to come um, talk, talk with all the partners of the deal. And once they have a discussion, once they're actually at the negotiation table, then they'll actually start, you know, potentially making some of these goodwill gestures in part of this mutual return. However, Iran rejected those initial U.S. offers for talks. So now we're in a bit of a stalemate. And now on the Iranian side, uh, they've been saying that if the U.S. goes back into compliance, we go back into compliance, right? So when Biden came to office, they started demonstrating more flexibility, however, and have signaled that they've opened up to the idea of step-by-step -step reciprocal parallel return to the deal. But while all this is happening, we're seeing massive divide within the Iranian government, right? And especially between hardliners and moderates, but even within Rouhani's own moderate administration. And at the end of the day, there are just as much as there are political restraints in the United States. So one thing I forgot to mention is that um, on the U.S. side, the Biden administration is restrained politically as well, you know, he's trying to get uh, his political appointees confirmed through the Senate. Senator Menendez, who is the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, is a massive anti-Iran nuclear agreement proponent. But at the end of the day, the Biden team wants to make sure that Senator Menendez is happy so that way their political appointees can be confirmed. So there is some political constrictions within the United States domestically. There are also those restraints domestically inside of Iran. And with the Iranian elections coming up in June, we're seeing a lot of domestic politicking. So right now we're seeing Rouhani entering his lame duck period. Um, and again, there's even division within his own administration. The hardliners at the end of the day don't want talks to happen before the election because the moderates' political popularity would increase right before the election. So government to government diplomacy can feel really far removed for individual people who do not have day jobs in the State Department or for those outside the United States of foreign ministry. For those here in the U.S., what can they do to let policymakers know where they stand? That's an excellent question. We have to remember at the end of the day, we are the ones who elect the people in office. We elect our members of Congress. We elect the president. They work for us. We're their bosses. So it's, it's up to us to make sure that we're uh, letting them know what the public wants them to do. So today we actually launched our Reseal the Deal Week of Action with a number of really excellent grassroots organizations from across the country. And the idea of our Week of Action is to essentially give citizens, residents, folks who live in the United States, the tools they need to contact them, their members of Congress easily and to contact the Biden administration easily. So each day is anchored in a different grassroots action we're asking folks to take. So today, Monday, we are launching a petition with Daily Coast. Our goal is to get 100,000 signers on the petition and we'll be delivering them to Congress and to the White House. 
On um, Tuesday, we're doing a Twitter storm at 1 p.m. Eastern time to get hashtag reseal the deal trending. And then on Wednesday, we're hosting an expert panel called the Iran Nuclear Deal or No Deal. We have some really stellar guests joining like Trita Parsi, Barbara Slavin, Kelsey Davenport, Peter Beinart. Opening remarks are going to be made by Senator Chris Murphy. He'll be joining us live. So we're very excited about that. Thursday, we're, we're giving folks the tools they need to actually call their members of Congress. And then Friday is, you know, the last push. If you haven't done any of the things earlier in the week, Friday is your last chance to do it. So for folks who actually want to learn more about the week of action, we do have a website. The link is very long, so I'm just going to give you the bit.ly. Um, so the bit.ly link is bit.ly slash three F as in Frank, Z as in zebra, D as in dog, LQ7. Well, Donna, thank you so much for coming on and sharing that. Our seven minutes are up, and I hope our listeners all go to the website to learn more. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner, and I'm the Managing Director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate, If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, $500, your generosity helps create a safer future free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation. Or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. It is budget season in Washington, and we are about one month away from the Biden administration's first military budget submission to Congress. And what is the most controversial weapon this year? You might say it's the troubled F-35 fighter jet or the Ford class aircraft carrier, both of which carry multi-billion dollar price tags. But there's one major defense program that is still in development, meaning that if we cancel it now, we can save much of its 264 billion cost. That money could be much better spent on the Biden administration's ambitious domestic agenda, such as fighting the pandemic, climate change, or racial injustice. This weapon also has the dubious distinction that it would likely never be used, not even in nuclear war. Its best use, indeed its official justification, is to be destroyed in the ground, never to be launched. Of course, I'm talking about the Air Force's proposed Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, ICBM, known as the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent, or GBSD, And I'll apologize in advance for all of the acronyms. We'll try not to use too many of them. Just last week, Senator Ed Markey and Congressman Ro Khanna introduced legislation to stop this program and transfer the savings to fighting the coronavirus pandemic. Full disclosure, Plowshares Fund supports this bill. And the Federation of American Scientists just released a new report on the ICBM program, a deep dive into all the reasons why this program should be canceled. And that report is called Siloed Thinking, A Closer Look at the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent. We are fortunate to have the author of that report with us today, Matt Corda, Research Associate at FAS. Matt, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. So let's start with the official story. Uh, Part of the reason that this new missile is so controversial is that the justification for it seems so weak. Can you help us understand the official rationale? What is the Air Force case for this? Sure, absolutely. So in 2014, the Air Force conducted 
what's called an analysis of alternatives for the GBSD. And during which they also considered, you know, a bunch of other possibilities for the program, you know, such as um, life extending the current Minuteman three force. And ultimately the analysis of alternatives ruled out that option and recommended pursuing GBSD instead. And they offered a few different justifications, you know, suggesting that the GBSD would address um, some perceived capability gaps um, they said that it would, you know, maintain the health of the industrial base, that it could potentially share some commonality with the Navy's missiles. But most importantly, they suggested that it would be cheaper than the cost of a Minuteman three life extension. And what my uh, report uh, suggests is that all of these assumptions appear to have either been flawed uh, or exaggerated or since um, deprioritized. And they ended up heavily biasing the Pentagon's decision to pursue GBSD instead of a Minuteman three life extension. And so, you know, I think the most important thing to address kind of head on is the cost factor, because it was the most important justification for why they ended up going with the GBSD. And so, you know, as, as part of the analysis of alternatives process, the Pentagon conducted a cost assessment and they compared the cost of life extending the current ICBM force um, and the cost of building these brand new missiles. And what they found was that building a brand new set of missiles from scratch would somehow cost less than life extending the current missiles. And this is pretty counterintuitive. Um, it doesn't really make that much sense, especially since um, studies actually sponsored by the Air Force years earlier had suggested that buying a brand new set of missiles could cost up to two to three times more than a relatively simple life extension. So how did the Air Force arrive at basically the opposite conclusion. The answer is that they effectively did their calculations based on the assumption that they would maintain the current ICBM force levels until 2075. And if you pick that really precise time frame, then their calculations sort of work out. But if you select a slightly different time frame, right, um, maintaining the force until 2050, for example, or even till 2100, then the calculations change significantly. And it would have been quite clear that Minuteman 3 was the vastly cheaper option. And given that the year 2075 is not really laid out in any kind of supporting documentation or borne out in any kind of strategic requirement, um, my report suggests that this kind of arbitrary year was selected in order to um, bias the outcome in favor of the GBSD. And, you know, it's, it's also, I think, just a little bit frustrating um, to see that these kinds of calculations were made on the assumption that the United States would maintain the exact same force posture until you know, 2075 without accounting for the fact that um, future arms control agreements or disarmament obligations could have some kind of effect on the size of the ICBM force. And by contrast, you know, there's really very little public evidence to suggest that the Minuteman III force could not be life extended at a much lower cost, right? The, the missiles, um, critical subsystems, like the, the guidance and propulsion modules, they show really high reliability as they get older. Um, and the Air Force has even acknowledged that they really don't have that much data on how these systems age out over time, right? They, they've, they've called it an engineering best guess, right? So uh, what we do know, though, is that, you know, in the event that these systems did need to be replaced, the Air Force has a really good track record of doing it at a very low cost, right? They, they did a life extension program in the mid 2000s. Um, it cost about $7 billion, which is you know, relatively low compared to the GBSD's price tag of, of several hundred billion dollars. They, it cost $7 billion to make the missiles um, brand new except for the shell is what Air Force analysts called it at the time. And so you know, all of this suggests that the Air Force's justifications for pursuing the GBSD instead of life extending the current missiles, um, were pretty flawed and, and biased in favor of pursuing their preferred outcome. But the thing is, it's, it's not just the specific GBSD program that has such a weak justification. It's the rationale for maintaining ICBMs in the U.S. arsenal at all, right? So, um, you know, during the Cold War, the U.S. planned to use ICBMs as, as damage limitation tools, as a means of um, reducing the Soviet Union's destructive potential in the event of a nuclear war. But the Pentagon has, has openly acknowledged today that that kind of situation, that, that bolt from the blue situation is extremely unlikely. And that's largely because of the role that US ballistic missile submarines play in, in ensuring that the United States has a uh, reliable second strike force. So as a result, we have ICBMs playing this role 
in nuclear force posture that we don't necessarily require in the post-Cold War era. And nuclear force guidance, you know, isn't set in stone, right? A president can change that anytime. And there are a lot of reasons why a president might want to do that to reduce or eliminate the role of ICBM. So we, we, can, we can talk about that a little bit more. Yes, yes. You're, you're, you're on to my next question, which is, as your report describes, ICBMs are inherently problematic in a number of different ways. So can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my, my report kind of suggests that ICBMs have a few inherent problems with some pretty significant consequences, regardless of their, their targeting role. And so the first of these is that ICBMs invite a really devastating attack on, on U.S. soil, right? So sometimes, you know, I, f- I feel like sometimes when we get into the, the weeds of things like um, counterforce strikes and, you know, aim points and stuff like that, we obscure what an attack involving several hundred warheads on, you know, the, the, the Great Plains in the United States would really look like. And what we would see in that situation is um, nothing short of the complete collapse of American society as we know it, right? We've um, sometimes heard arguments in the past that, you know, ICBMs have the potential to somehow save lives because they direct fire towards these sparsely populated areas of the United States um, because that's where the silos are located. But in reality, nothing is further from the truth, right? We know from the accounts of survivors at Hiroshima um, that the bombing there destroyed over 80% of all the hospitals in the, in the city. And today's bombs right, are an order of magnitude more destructive. Um, you know, and the, the uh, privatized American healthcare system is already um, uniquely strained on a, on a regular basis, right? In the event of a nuclear attack, um, it, would, it would effectively just disintegrate. And you know, the states where ICBMs are deployed, um, which effectively are, are like ground zero for a nuclear strike, also produce you know, about half the United States' caloric intake, right? So you have national and regional food shortages, you have um, other disruptions to key industries like energy, manufacturing, banking, transportation, you have huge population displacement, right? And then um, on top of that, the damage would not be limited to the United States because you know, there's um, huge environmental and, and ecological uh, destruction that would, that would happen you know, basically to the entire world, right? We'd see a, a huge cooling phenomenon and, and global famines and stuff. So, you know, there, there are a lot of kind of social and economic and environmental factors to consider here, but the important takeaway is that ICBMs are not a, they're not a life-saving tool by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, they're, they're a giant target in the middle of the country that invites a really devastating attack on U.S. soil um, from which basically the, the country would never recover. So that's, that's um, kind of the first thing that my report explores. The second one is um, ICBMs have really significant limitations in addressing 21st century deterrence challenges, right? So um, their flight paths would force them to overfly Russian territory on the way to potentially targets in China or North Korea or Iran, right? This places really serious constraints under the conditions under which they would actually be used, meaning that they're not actually particularly useful um, in a post-Cold War era, right? And there, and there are other um, systems in the U.S. nuclear arsenal that are better suited for those kinds of targeting missions. The third major problem, and perhaps the most important one, is that ICBMs can bias a president towards launching nuclear weapons very quickly in a crisis. And this has been you know, openly acknowledged by um, former commanders of U.S. Strategic Command and former secretaries of defense who have suggested that the ICBM force um, is inherently vulnerable, right? By the fact that they have these known fixed locations that you can see from space, right? They can easily be targeted in a, in a, in a first strike. And this means that in the event of, of that kind of strike or, or even a false alarm, right? Which are um, more common than you might think. I think um, in the seventies and eighties, there were averaging about like three moderately serious false alarms per week. Right? So in the event of a, of, of a crisis like that, a president would have only a couple of minutes to decide whether or not to launch ICBMs. And Reagan actually, you know, he wrote about this problem in his autobiography and, and um, you know, he suggested, I think I'm quoting him correctly here when he's, he said, you know, there's only six minutes to decide how to respond to a blip on a radar screen and decide whether or not to unleash Armageddon. How can anyone apply reason at a time like that? And, he, and he's right. Right? So the other elements of the U.S. nuclear arsenal, right, especially submarines, don't have those same kinds of time pressures because they are essentially invulnerable to a first strike because their locations are not known. Right? This means that 
ICBMs can be considered to be an inherently destabilizing weapon system. Thanks. Uh, you've, you've done a great job of reviewing why these weapons are redundant, dangerous, uh, and as we've discussed, incredibly expensive. So what can we do about those dangers? And ultimately, do we need these weapons at all? You know, as, as we spoke about, ICBMs come with some really serious and destabilizing qualities, but the targeting requirement for which they are being employed that targeting requirement does not need to be kept in U.S. nuclear posture, right? As, as um, I and others have, have argued recently, the United States could eliminate its requirement to pursue preemptive damage-limiting nuclear strikes. And that is the role that um, the ICBMs have historically fulfilled in U.S. nuclear strategy, right? So instead of relying on ICBMs, um, you know, we could prioritize the role of ballistic missile submarines, which are the most survivable leg of the triad, in ensuring that the United States could you know, ride out a nuclear attack, accurately assess damage, and still maintain um, an assured retaliatory capability. And doing that would expand presidential decision time from, you know, just a couple minutes to um, perhaps several hours or perhaps even several days, right? That's, that's effectively the nuclear doctrine of the United Kingdom, right? Which possesses, you know, they, they have only about four um, ballistic missile submarines. They usually deploy only one at sea. And they rely on, you know, a modernized and backstopped command and control infrastructure to make sure that they always have communication with their boats. And even in the event that they didn't have communication with their boats, they, their boats would still have orders on them, right? So they, they maintain this assured retaliatory structure. And the U.S. has all the capabilities necessary in order to make its own shift towards that kind of posture, which would dramatically reduce the pressures on a president to launch really quickly in a nuclear crisis. And ultimately, you know, that decision to revise nuclear employ employment guidance lies in the hands of the president. And revising that kind of guidance is not unusual, right? It's, it's um, believed that, you know, the nuclear war plan has been revised, you know, nearly 20 times since the end of the Cold War, right? So if a president wanted to shift away from the United States' longstanding doctrine to use ICBMs as this kind of damage limiting measure, um, then that military requirement to maintain ICBMs would kind of go away. Now let's talk a little bit more about um, submarines because you know the often stated justification for ICBMs is they are an insurance policy in case the submarines become vulnerable. What is your take on that? As you mentioned, one of the arguments that we, that we often hear about retaining ICBMs as this kind of hedge against the future vulnerability of the, of the submarine force. As the argument goes, if technological innovation, right, suddenly kind of um, makes the oceans transparent, or if perhaps a, an unanticipated, you know, technical failure could potentially ground, you know, the U.S. submarine force, then ICBM advocates sometimes suggest that the that ICBMs are the only things preventing, you know, an adversary from from disabling the U.S.'s retaliatory capability. But I would suggest that those fears are um, pretty uh, exaggerated in a, in a few key respects. And so first, you know, in the kind of unlikely event that the entire submarine force is grounded um, all at once, right, the U.S. still has a really highly capable bomber force that can be deployed in a crisis. And there have been some studies recently suggesting that in the event of a, of a prolonged nuclear crisis, U.S. nuclear bombers most of them, or perhaps even all of them, would get airborne in time to survive, right? So we already have the bombers as the hedge against submarine vulnerability. Why do we also need the ICBMs? Second, I would also suggest that it's pretty unlikely that some kind of unforeseen technological development will suddenly make the oceans transparent. ICBM advocates have been making that same argument for decades in the 80s when the, the MX ICBM was being debated, right? It's the exact same language sometimes, um, right? It's, it's often kind of employed really explicitly as a defense against proposed reductions to the ICBM force. Um, but it has never really come close to uh, coming true, right? The, the U.S.'s submarines are among the quietest on the planet. Um, the next generation of ballistic missile submarines are going to be even quieter, right, with the introduction of um, new electric drive propulsion. Um, and it's also important to remember, I think, that technology development is, is pretty slow, right? It, and it doesn't happen um, in a vacuum, right? So during the Cold War, the United States 
achieved basically unrivaled superiority in both submarine quieting and submarine detection by having its own engineers kind of play this like cat and mouse game against each other. It's kind of like, um, like technological chess and the United States has always been much better than its competitors at both the quieting and the detection side of things. So if, you know, if any country should be worried about the oceans becoming quote unquote transparent, it's really not the United States. It's, it should be countries with much um, less quiet submarines, right? Like, like China or Russia. It's also important to remember that even if an adversary finds a US submarine, actually destroying it is, is, is much harder than it seems on paper, right? There's a huge amount of logistics involved in, in tracking and destroying submarines. Um, they can scramble away pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, several different studies have suggested that it could take, you know, over 20 nuclear warheads to disable a single U.S. submarine, even after that submarine gave away its location, right? So when researching this report, I found a pretty interesting passage buried in this, um, this Government Accountability Office report where they, they did an evaluation of the U.S. nuclear force. And they wrote that the Pentagon had continuously overvalued Soviet submarine detection and undervalued U.S. submarine survivability. And they explicitly said this was done as a justification for costly modernization in the other legs of the triad to hedge, quote unquote, against submarine vulnerability. Right. So we're, and that report was in 1993. We're seeing the exact same reasoning today with, with regards to the ICBM replacement program, um, which is the GBSD. Great point and that and that gets me to my next question which is that you know our, our listeners as they're probably uh, suspecting by now this is not all about policy there's a lot of politics involved in these things and so tell us how you see politics playing a role in the ICBM debate you know throughout the cold war politicians in the in the great plains the midwest right um, advocated for bringing missiles to their districts um, often because those districts were largely underfunded by the government um, and new missiles meant you know, new waves of government investment in things like roads for the missiles to travel on, right? Telephone lines for communication with the ICBM bases, um, you know, stuff like that. I think it's also kind of worth reflecting on the fact that many of those communities had lived without those, you know, basic necessities for, um, for decades. And it was the demands of the missiles and not the demands of the residents that kind of forced the government to start investing in those communities. And so in a lot of ways that that phenomenon hasn't really gone away, right? So it's, it's not really a surprise that politicians today are, are very nervous about the prospect of ICBMs leaving their districts. And today they, they work together on a bipartisan basis to advocate for just kind of keeping ICBMs in their, in their districts. Uh, and so, you know, kind of the main players here are um, senators from the three ICBM host states, right, from Wyoming and, and Montana and North Dakota, um, and also Utah, where um, a lot of ICBM sustainment activities take place. Over the past um, 15 years in particular, the members of that kind of ICBM coalition have played a really uh, outsized role in dictating U.S. nuclear force posture and sometimes even overriding the guidelines set by military leaders or by the Pentagon um, in order to prevent ICBM force reductions from taking place. Right? So an example of this is you know, during New START force posture negotiations in 2013, the ICBM coalition specifically blocked the Pentagon from conducting an environmental impact assessment, um, which would be used to determine uh, kind of how, to, to take the first step towards potentially eliminating some old silos. And in subsequent statements, right, the, the coalition members specifically talked about how the Pentagon had tried to find a way around their legislation, but the coalition put all this pressure on them and then the Pentagon backed off, right? So that, you know, those kinds of actions are, are really consequential and they have been very consequential in determining U.S. nuclear force posture levels um, under New START, right? So by the time that those central limits of the treaty went into effect, the reduction of the ICBM leg was substantially smaller than the reductions in the air leg or the sea legs of the triad, right? So, um, and I, I would suggest that given the fact that the Pentagon actively, it seems, did try to uh, take a look at reducing the ICBM force in some capacity, but, but were kind of pushed back on by the coalition, I'd say it's kind of fair to suggest that um, the coalition has been very successful in kind of maintaining their, their ICBM bases. And, 
you know, it's, it's important to note that these members of Congress, they're very well funded by weapons contractors and, and other corporations that stand to you know, materially benefit from the GBSD program. And, you know, the main concern for, for those politicians is, is jobs in their district. But in reality, it seems that the ICBM force does not actually create that many jobs. The Costs of War Project um, at Brown University has done a lot of great work on this, and they've found that, you know, for the same amount of spending, you can create 40% more jobs by directing that money towards um, clean energy and infrastructure. You can get 100% um, more jobs by directing it towards healthcare and 120% more jobs by directing it towards education. If I remember correctly, they suggested that for every $1 billion that they shift from defense to green energy, you get a net increase of 2,000 jobs. So it's clear that defense investment is actually one of the, the least productive ways of allocating money to these communities. And that if you kind of redirect the, these defense dollars towards um, these other kinds of priorities, you can help increase uh, local communities' resilience and make sure that they kind of have what they need for, for those kinds of transformations. Thanks. Now, you write in your report that um, pursuing life extension of the current ICBM, the Minuteman III, uh, might actually be less risky uh, and certainly less expensive than building a brand new missile, uh, the GBSD. Uh, how did you get to that conclusion? Yeah, so you know we've we've talked a little bit about the about the cost, but there's um there's you know something else to to think about, which is just the the risk associated with pursuing this kind of um, huge, really ambitious program uh, right now. So, you know, large procurement programs like the GBSD, they're prone to delays just kind of as a, a matter of course. And this particular program has a lot of really specific problems with it that, you know, raise a lot of red flags. So I think first of which, it's important to note that, you know, this, this huge GBSD modernization program is being administered by um, Air Force Global Strike Command, which is a relatively new command. They started up in, in 2010. Um, they have a pretty small staff. They have no prior experience fielding a, a major weapon system, let alone um, multiple very ambitious and simultaneous programs, right? Like the, there's the GBSD, but that's happening alongside programs like the B-21 bomber, um, the long range standoff, uh, air launch cruise missile, right? So, the, you know, they, and they're a, a relatively underfunded command. So, you know, there, there could be problems there. Secondly, there, there are really significant logistical challenges associated with converting the launch facilities to accommodate GBSD, right? So according to the Pentagon, in order for the GBSD to hit its um, operational capability uh, date of 2036, they have to convert one facility per week for nine years with no delays. That is a very ambitious schedule. Um, and as a result, the GBSD actually carries a schedule that's been designated high risk by the Air Force. A third potential problem Adjacent programs to the GBSD are probably also going to face some delays, right? So specifically, I'm, I'm talking about the, the new W87-1 warheads that are going to be deployed with the system. That's already the most expensive warhead program since the end of the Cold War, and it's on an already impossible schedule that basically no one expects it to meet, including the Pentagon, right? So as a result, the Air Force is already planning on deploying the GBSD with older legacy warheads. Right, so we're already seeing kind of delays in the surrounding programs. And then fourth, and I think, you know, perhaps the most important, we talked about costs before, but in the middle of a defense budget crisis, I think it's pretty important to acknowledge the risks associated with prioritizing GBSD over other very important security priorities. Right? But like by its own admission, the Pentagon cannot afford to buy all of the weapons that it wants to buy. Right? In, in um, July of last year, the Air Force Chief of Staff said this. He said, you know, this is the first time that the United States has tried to simultaneously modernize the nuclear enterprise and the conventional enterprise. And the current budget does not allow you to do both. Right. That's a that is basically a direct quote. Right. And those tensions are already coming into focus. Right. We saw um, around this time last year the decision to increase the budget of the National Nuclear Security Administration, you know, which is you know, directly involved with this program that led to the cutting of a Virginia class submarine from the Navy, right? So, so we're already seeing these trade-offs. And I think this is kind of what the affordability arguments about GBSD um, often, it's, it's where these arguments kind of fall apart a little bit, 
because the true cost of the ground race strategic deterrent, it's not just the money that is being spent to acquire it. It's also the fact that prioritizing this program right now means deprioritizing other programs. And, you know, in, in 2017, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the entire nuclear modernization program would cost about $1.2 trillion. Those costs are absolutely going to increase with inflation, but also with um, just, just normal programmatic overruns. And given the fact that, you know, so many programs over the next several decades um, are being described as, you know, these fiscal time bombs, because they're all happening at the same time, it seems really irresponsible to spend, you know, about $100 billion to acquire GBSD right now, when that decision could be deferred for several decades, right? If, if, if um, the United States decided to life extend Minutemen right now, then you don't have, even have to think about GBSD for another like 20 years, right? And that allows you to reallocate that money towards more important security priorities. Now, as we said at the top of the show, the Biden administration is uh, putting together its first defense budget submission to, uh, to Congress right now. Um, how do you see this issue playing out going forward? With all of this in mind, I would say that it's time to take a, a closer look at this, um, at this $260 billion program and ask ourselves, in the middle of a pandemic that has cost so many lives and so many jobs and you know, only a couple months after um, armed insurrectionists are in the Capitol, right? Are these missiles actually going to keep people safe, right? Is this the best possible investment in our safety that we could be making right now? Um, I would suggest no, but I, I, uh, I would hope that at the very least um, they take a closer look. Matt, thanks very much. Our time is up, but I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and best of luck in all your work. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Derek Sender, Will Lowry, and Delphine Vigil, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpey. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.